Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you uh, everybody for joining us today for our webinar, Tackling Litter and Recycling Contamination, Steps to Influence Behavior in Parks and Other Outdoor Public Spaces. My name is Alec Cooley and I'll be your moderator today for this program as I am for the, um, the rest of our ongoing Bush Systems Green Thinking webinar series, um, where we bring together experts and local folks from local communities just to talk about how they are running their programs in different settings what are some of the best practices, experiences that they have uh, learned uh, that we can help to spread some of that knowledge around and help other communities to improve their programs? Uh, some of you may have tuned in last April to another program we did that was also focused on outdoor public spaces. Um, that program looked at broader range of operational issues related to parks and other settings. Uh, we do have the recording and presentations from that program from last April available on our website, which I can point you to later. Uh, today's program, as, as the title implies, is really going to focus uh, specifically on some of these, what I would call user-related challenges. It's the litter, it's the cross-contamination, it's, it's issues where we're trying to influence people and how they interact with bins and, and public spaces to address these issues. We have an excellent panel today. I'm particularly excited. Uh, we have um, we have uh, years of experience um, uh, with, with our panelists who are joining us today. Um, we're gonna start with two presentations at the very beginning that are gonna focus more on the research and best practices. We have Morgan Turner, who is a senior project manager with the consulting firm Gershman, Brickner and Bratton, um, also known as, as GBB. Morgan is gonna talk about some of the emerging ways that technology can be used to better understand how foot traffic and other usage patterns in and around public spaces and the bins um, how that information can be used to optimize and improve where bins are placed and other aspects for um, public space trash and recycling bins. After Morgan, we'll have uh, Dr. Cecile Carson, who is the CEO of Carson Consulting, as well as a former colleague of mine working with the National Office of Keep America Beautiful for many years. Cecile is gonna review some of the research and key takeaways from about how waste receptacles and other practices can influence litter patterns specifically uh, based on some of the academic research that she and others have done in this area. Um, following Morgan and Cecile, we're gonna pivot and, and uh, shift to more of a case study um, where we're gonna see how things are really happening in the field. Um, and to do that, we have uh, Todd Burley and Jenny Frankel with the city of Seattle. Uh, Todd is a sustainability advisor with the Seattle Parks and Recreation, and Jenny is the uh, senior advisor and development specialist with Seattle Public Utilities. Um, together, they are going to share uh, an overview of how their respective city agencies manage waste recycling collections from parks, downtown streetscapes, and other public spaces uh, in Seattle. Then following their presentations, we're gonna shift gears and um, set aside a good chunk of time for more of an extended panel discussion where we're gonna talk through some of these common issues around litter and recycling contamination. Um, and so we'll, uh, throughout that, we'll also be taking your questions and um, addressing those uh, dur during, both after each presentation and then during the discussion at the very end. Uh, once we're done with the, the full, uh, discussion after about 90 minutes as a panel, we're gonna sign off and I'm gonna invite a couple of colleagues, Chris and Brian um, from uh, who are our Bush Systems Sales and they're gonna do a demonstration about some of the recycling and waste bin products that Bush Systems offers. Again, that's that'll be separate from this program, but for those who are interested to stay on and, and learn more about that, we encourage you to do so. Um, as I mentioned a moment ago, we're going to take questions. Um, it, one of the challenges of, uh, of doing virtual programs is we don't have the ability to interact directly in a room, but, uh, but we want to uh, leverage to the extent we can uh, the ability to make this interactive. So we do have the chat function, which is uh, we encourage you to share your own experiences. Um, as if we're on a topic and you know, a, a speaker makes a point and you have something to riff off of that, we encourage you to just drop notes into that the chat of how you're doing it in your own local community um, and, and share those and see if we can't get uh, some of the discussion going back and forth uh, parallel to the presentations, see if we can get a discussion going in the chat. Um, and then separately, if you have questions specifically for the panelists that you want to share and you would like them to actually respond to, put those directly into the question and answer field in your Zoom toolbar. Um, and that will help us by keeping those 
separate, it helps us to manage and make sure that the, the questions intended for the, the live presentation uh, get, get vocalized. Um, also, point, uh, keep note that we will be dropping on a couple occasions during the program, we're going to drop some uh, resources and links to uh, uh, studies, other aspects that are being discussed. We're going to drop those into the chat um, at various points during the program. And then following uh, today's program, within the next day or two, we will send out an email that will link you to the recording for today's program, uh, the individual presentation slides, as well as um, a whole range of these resources that we're putting into the chat. We'll also have that posted onto a web page, um, and you'll receive an email on how to find some of those. So uh, just keep all of that in mind. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to start out with just sort of set the stage for today's program. Um, we should start by acknowledging that collecting, recycling, and waste in public spaces is not easy. Um, getting people to sort cycles correctly is difficult in any situation, but especially in locations like parks and downtown areas where there are few, few if any, controls on who can use them or what items they may be discarding. Compounding this is the on-the-go nature of these areas, which limit our ability to engage or educate people. And, and then, of course, there are the issues of just what I would call misuse, um, vandalism, people, uh, that this, the, the use and abuse that can happen with bins in a public setting. All these create their own challenges, not to mention the fact that some people simply toss stuff on the ground. When I first reached out to Todd and Jenny about a Seattle case study, they, they were quick to point out that they don't have things perfect in Seattle. Um, and, 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 and so I shared with them, um, that, that that's great, because I think that reflects a basic reality that there are no communities that have really solved these issues. Um, I think all of us, to some extent, one or another, uh, or another struggle with some of these issues uh, perpetually. Um, there are no perfect programs, but I think there are rather, the goal is more how do we minimize them? How do we take some of the best practices um, to make them manageable and improve, improve uh, these issues over time? So the good news is that there are concrete steps um, and practices that can be done that have been proven. There's research in some cases, there's, there's a wealth of experience that doing things like using some of the best practices around bin and signage design, other aspects that we're gonna to discuss today, um, that those can make a measurable impact and help to improve programs over time. So with that, I wanna go ahead and hand it over to our speakers and say we're gonna start first with uh, Morgan Turner with TBB. And first, just a, a quick note um, on behalf of Morgan, uh, she, she had caught the stomach flu, and so she's not feeling well, but she was graceful enough, um, willing to still join us, but she's going to uh, join us just with her camera turned off. And, and Thank you, yeah. Alec. Whatever. Thank you. Um, so happy to be here. Great distraction. And um, yes, leaving the camera off, but um, thrilled to have this topic to talk about and giving me energy. So welcome, everyone. Um, I'm going to be talking about some of the technology tools that can be used to confirm best practices or install best practices in parks and public spaces. Um, as Alec mentioned, I am with GBV. And we are a solid waste management consulting firm. We help public and private sector organizations find solutions for their waste management challenges. And we're on a mission to provide innovative, responsible, sustainable, and economical strategies. Uh, our vision includes guiding those communities and helping them find valuable and quality solutions, obviously protecting the environment and a circular economy. And to support that vision and mission, we offer comprehensive services in the waste management consulting area. So to get into the technology that we can apply for some of these public space challenges, uh, we want to talk about why those tools are necessary, um, recognizing that parks and public spaces have limited resources. Um, that's probably financial, potentially also labor, time, um, access, what your contracts say for your hauler. You just have limited resources, so you need to be smart about how you're using those resources. And then you have local factors. So what works for Central Park may not work for you. And so how do you understand the personality of your space and better set up your system to prevent litter and contamination? 
So whenever we're looking at a problem, um, if we're going to be innovative, we want to look at changes in the landscape, including changes in social, technological, environmental, economic, and political uh, realms and factors. And so today, really focusing on that technology piece. So in looking ahead for trends for 2022, technology is um, blowing our minds, a little difficult to comprehend um, because so much of it is intangible, but some top trends for 2022 include artificial intelligence or AI, 5G, and Internet of Things. Those would be the top ones I would say are really influencing the waste space. And then some others listed here um, that I'm sure are coming and we'll see the connection soon. And so the first tool that I wanna talk about on the technology side is using GIS for your program. Um, GIS is a software and system so you can visualize geographic data, locations of features. So anything that can be placed in space, whether that's as a point, um, a hexagon, a boundary, a path, uh, using that GIS to your advantage for your program. And the way that we've used this is um, using GIS to plan your bin placement patterns and then estimate, for example, how far apart are those bins? How far would someone have to walk from uh, the parking lot to find a bin, from a concession stand to find a bin, from a food truck to find a bin? Also using GIS to geolocate not only your assets, so your bins and your dumpsters and where trucks can access your site, but also where are you seeing litter? Where are you seeing repeated illegal dumping? Where are you seeing um, cigarette butts? And marking that on a map so you can begin to understand and break down your site into these hotspots. GIS can also be used to confirm that you have co-located bins. So maybe that was your intention when you designed the program, um, but by going through and mapping on a tablet where your bins are, you may find that bins have gotten moved or damaged and not replaced. Uh, do you have co-location where you want it? And maybe trash only where recycling would just be contaminated. Uh, we can also use GIS to evaluate proximity to key locations, kind of mentioned that with the walk sheds. How far are you from places where waste is generated in higher amounts or where visitors may only have a brief second passing that bin to make a decision? Uh, you can also use GIS to remove bins. Um, sometimes more bins is not the answer and it's about smart placement. So you could use GIS to see if your bins are too close together and are giving the impression that um, that bins will be available throughout the space and instead of in key locations. You can also use GIS to adjust your service areas. So if you have multiple crews, for example, servicing an area um, or multiple shifts, you could look at how many bins are servicing, how many of those bins are in a high traffic area and start to right size your routes and your collection schedules for your, your labor resources. And then that kind of exciting one is using your a map of your facility and your waste sort or your waste audit data together. So rather than doing one waste audit across the whole site, do you want to geolocate where the bags are from and see if you're seeing trends in certain areas, especially in the larger facilities or the multiple city blocks that you may be dealing with? And then if we're looking forward to the future, by mapping and geotagging our resources, we can also start to use artificial intelligence to look at how maybe weather affects park attendance and where. Um, sunny days, people hang out here. This is where the litter shows up. Rainy days, the picnic shelters get more use and we're gonna need more pickup there. Um, and then also applying, again, those attendance trends. Um, when you have festivals and events, where do you see litter afterwards? Where can you concentrate temporary bins to support your full-time bins? Um, but having the computer think through that for you um, based on the map and the data you've provided and the analy um, analysis tools within GIS itself. So the second tool is a little creepy. Um, so now we're going to talk about cell phone data. So cell phone data is um, data sets based on tracking the movement of a mobile device. So triangulating a cell phone signal based off cell towers or um, off a Wi-Fi signal. So when you jump on a public Wi-Fi, uh, locating where you are. And this data is used by uh, entities around the world to build a profile 
understand people's patterns and make predictions about the future. And so some of those patterns include um, if your cell phone is at a particular address between, say, 7 p.m. and 7 a.m., um, the profile is going to assume that that's your home address. Oh, and it looks like we're not sharing the screen. Maybe for some users. Um, if your address is at a certain location between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. <laughs> prior to COVID, that might be your office location and also your favorite lunch spot if your phone leaves at 11 and comes back at noon uh, and goes to a cafe. So you can see how your data could be used to create patterns. And the way we want to use that on the wayside is designing signage and bin placement um, based on those patterns. And so I'm seeing a question in the chat I just want to address. Um, I'm not suggesting tracking people's movements without their knowledge. Um, this is happening. This is part of your mobile device uh, user agreement <laughs> with your cell phone carrier. So this would not be a suggestion that local municipalities begin to track people in an additional way. It would be to, if you would like to use this data, purchase these data sets from data brokers. Uh, the data sets are scrubbed of identifying information in terms of age and phone number, um, actual street address. They would give kind of a general location of how many people live in a certain radius. Um, but this is this has been happening. This is happening. This data is available um, for, I would say, all of us. Um, in terms of how we can use it, you can purchase the data for a specific boundary. So for example, if you're working with a national park that has several acres, several hundreds of acres, you can draw that boundary around the property, purchase the data for that location for a specific time period, and then analyze it. And the way you would use it is to understand your visitor. And the data can tell you, depending on what you purchase, where people visit from. So are they visiting from states that have strong recycling programs? Are they visiting from states where that work is still in progress? Are they visiting from an area that maybe has a strong second language? And the data can tell you um, what percent of visitors to your park originate from what area, and then based on the census, how old a percentage of them are, um, their income level. Um, and this is not by person, this is not identifiable to Morgan Turner, but based on census data, if you have so many visitors from an area, what will they look like? What are their habits? Um, what are their political leanings? What are their demographics, their language, um, their age? We know that factors into recycling behaviors. So this is a very powerful um, data that you can use to improve your program. Um, and so then you could adjust your containers and your service based on who's visiting, uh, language preference, um, what programs they may have at home if you have a key visitor group that comes from a certain area. Uh, you also can get data about their visit durations. So are there, what percentage of folks come and stay for an hour? So maybe they're planning a packed lunch, they're having a picnic, um, they're bringing in more items than the person who comes for five minutes because they're taking a running trail that goes through the park and they're probably not generating waste. You also can break down your site into areas and see based on cell phone towers how detailed you can get, but um, where they may be visiting while they're in the park. And then key time periods. So if your park does not have open and closed hours or if your park is open dawn to dusk or if you're a public city street and that's a 24-7, you can see when that traffic peaks and maybe challenge some of your assumptions about when you should service bins and when uh, they may require more attention. So in the future, um, this the amount of data is only going to increase as 5G um, and expanded networks make triangulating a location um, easier, faster, more accurate, um, as people have service in more locations, they're going to be on their phones more, providing that data back to uh, the tracking. So told you it's creepy, uh, but very powerful, and it's sanitized for identifying information. So the last one is one that most of you are probably familiar with. It's QR codes. Um, 
these are a visual link to content. And basically you hold up a cell phone camera to this, it's gonna recognize the code and send you to this location. This QR code actually will take you to the Bush Systems registration page for this webinar. Um, but you could use them to um, bring data in or send data out. So if you used a QR code, you could have your visitors fill out a form when a bin is overflowing and when, or when a, an animal is present or a litter is present, then you could analyze trends. So not suggesting that you would use QR codes as like a service ticket mechanism, but over the course of time, can you start to see patterns of when people are reporting overflowing bins? Is there an event that you're not noticing because um, you don't have staff on site that keeps happening that's causing that? Do you have broken drinking fountains that people are trying to refill water bottles and instead are buying bottled water because it's not available? So you could use that for data in, and then you can also use it for data out. So we have such limited room on a recycling, uh, a sign on a recycling bin. So you could provide maybe pictures of your top materials and then a QR code that takes them to a, a mobile friendly site that explains what materials are recyclable, where that material goes, um, anything visitors can do to help. Um, so you could do data in, data out with the QR codes. And in the future, if we look at Internet of Things, which means infrastructure that's connected to each other, um, how will our bins and other support facilities, drinking fountains, restrooms, talk to each other to anticipate um, this bin's getting full, the next closest bin is going to get more waste, it needs a service ticket, or um, its capacity needs to be changed. So how will our, the system talk to itself and uh, improve. And so these tools are really about continuous improvement and resiliency, and you can use them to design your program or make tweaks, but you need to pair it with that behavioral understanding, which Cecile is gonna talk about, and then you can positively influence what visitors do with their waste. Great, thank you, Morgan. That was great. Um, uh, I personally find the uh, the different technologies that are starting to come online uh, incredibly exciting. I've, I've been in this industry for 25, 30 years and there's always been a frustration over just having sort of bins, it just a, 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 for lack of a better word, a, a non-smart bins um, and the frustration of not being able to really leverage and, and get more sophisticated in how we target people, how we understand how bins are being used. And I think this, um, what's happening with artificial intelligence and the ability with companies like Zabble and others that are starting to use uh, AI to be able to do, you know, in the moment, uh, uh, understand composition of what's happening inside of bins. Um, you know, some of this technology is still just, just coming in, it'll be years before it's really refined, but I think it opens up a lot of opportunities that can make us much more intelligent on how we design and, and understand usage. So. That's uh, exciting. Um, I, I have a question for you, a couple questions for you, but before we take that, let me introduce our first live poll. We're gonna do three of these. Um, so folks, go ahead and and uh, hit, um, hit your response to this, but you know, to, assuming that you are actually managing a program and involved with the public space, uh, what steps are you taking to manage and adjust your bin placement um, to optimize where bins are actually located? Um, so go ahead, go ahead and hit any one of these that apply to your situation. Um, and in the meantime, Morgan, um, one question I had is, so with, with the cell phone data, does that allow you to actually also monitor like traffic, like which direction people are coming from and what volume um, as they approach bins? Is, is that another way that, that that data can be used to optimize placement? And Sure, I can see a, a way that you might set up the boundary. So you have your your boundary and then you buy data for maybe the surrounding area split into quadrants. And then you could see folks are coming from um, this adjacent attraction, this adjacent museum, for example, to the park or um, from another direction. The, the problem is gonna be how much time they spend in those areas and then coming over and how that gets tied to the date and time. Um, the more useful part would be the volume. So you, you can get 
Um, so you can buy the data sets and you can also buy the analysis or do the analysis yourself, but you can get maps, uh, sorry, graphs of what times are most popular, what days are most popular, um, what areas, again, if you break it up, are most popular. So it's really the volumes and okay. any peaks, um, peaks by day, and then also peaks throughout the year. Uh, you know, if you have like a seasonal, um, a seasonal uh, park that's used, you may know when your key peak is, but are there other peaking events that are less significant that you want to look for? Um, so the volume, I would see really helpful. The, the direction uh, depends how you design it, I think. Sure. Uh, it, nonetheless, it, it points towards, maybe this is something that's, that's down the road, but um, but certainly understanding traffic patterns in relation to winds, where bins are placed. I yeah. think there's there's a lot of knowledge to be that, that um, the knowledge, there's a lot that we can do with knowledge. You know, do we reorder, rearrange bins to, you know, have the trash be the first one they approach first and having the ability to, to better understand those patterns. Um, sure. Potential. And I think that ties into the walk sheds, right? Is um, if you have sources of waste like a concession stand, um, how far can someone walk? Uh, reasonably and, uh, and looking at your bins in that area. And then um, some of the behaviors that happen in parking lots when people clean out their cars while they're waiting, um, looking at those areas separately to see what your bins look like in those areas and treating it less like a homogeneous space and more as kind of hot spots uh, based on what you map. Yeah, yeah. excellent. Well, we have, we have more questions that we'll want to come back to with this, but let's go ahead and close the poll. Um, if we could share the results, we'll just take a quick look at this to see what we're hearing. Um, looks like um, about 84% of people are saying that they've done, you know, based, adjusting based on proximity to key locations. So that's, that's kind of like a walk shed, um, understanding, just staying there and visually seeing where, where bins are in relation to uh, pathways, et cetera. Uh, smaller percentage, 34% adjusted using waste audits or litter mapping. Um, uh, removing redundant bins looks like about 44% have done that, and then a smaller percentage for GIS mapping and, and um, some of these other applications. So um, it's always interesting to see who's doing what and what patterns we have. Uh, practices are, are common. Let's go ahead and then move on to the next. Um, our next presenter, we have. Cecile, Dr. Cecile Carson, who is going to talk more about some of the research that's out there and what we know about uh, litter patterns. I'll hand it over to Cecile. Thanks, Alec. Um, and I appreciate this opportunity to, uh, to share um, information. Um, I'm going to cover, uh, as Morgan was saying, some of the behavioral uh, aspects of litter, uh, which tie both into the placement as well as the, the context of where uh, litter may occur in these public spaces, um, and some research uh, that in, in some cases may uh, reinforce some things that you are doing, and in other cases may contradict and, and may actually contradict within uh, the, the issue because because litter uh, is a is a complex uh, issue, and I'm working on getting it to move forward, and it doesn't seem like it wants to do that. Alec, would you thank you? Um, so this complex issue means that we have to look at both what the material is, which is the litter, as well as the behavior which is the throwing or tossing of those particular items. Um, and we've been studying litter uh, now in pretty much great detail since the 1970s, and we're still trying to solve, uh, solve, the, solve the issue. Um, but we do know that in public spaces, there are a number of things that, that can influence that, including uh, the, the the placement of the the placement of the bins, uh, the accessibility of them, um, the relationship between having uh, litter bins and also uh, trash cans and also recycling containers. 
Um, so there's a there's a cross connection in that. There's also sometimes a question about, well, you know, litter's litter. Is this really a, is there there's sort of significant issue of any kind? And there was a study done about five years ago by the U.S. Uh, a Sustainability Consumer Trends Database, kind of uh, following through on some of the, the comments from Morgan about using technology. And they ask people, it's sort of like, would you agree or disagree with the statement that I'm more concerned about environmental issues that I can see, like litter and abated built and abandoned buildings in comparison to other things that I can't, um, such as the climate or ocean pollution. And overwhelmingly, the, the high level of, of responses were across all age groups, from millennials to seniors, that this is an issue and that we need to continue to do something about it. But we also know, to Morgan's point, that a lot of this is very specific. So contextually, 87% um, of the, the research shows that it's an individual's behavior. But we know that individual behavior can be uh, influenced. So on the next slide, um, you'll see some research that talks about how litter attracts other, other litter. Um, and with that, uh, research back to uh, the 1990s, um, talked about what are the factors that, that influence. And overall, clean areas do have a tendency to stay, to stay clean. Um, but 20 years later, first research in 1990, a recent study that was just done in 2021, showed that even that introduction of one piece of litter into an area can create that sense that, well, maybe it's okay if I litter some, some more. Uh, in the process. So, you know, what happens if that one piece, which typically happens, creates even more litter and it expands to multiple pieces? And as you can see uh, from this study, it's sort of like it went back up again. And they looked at different types of public spaces. They looked at supermarkets, at parking lots, and an amusement park area, and in a dorm setting on a university, university campus. So we know that litter attracts litter in the past, and it appears that that litter is still attracting litter now. And we also know from the next slide that littering behaviors are influenced by the placement of containers. Um, an observational team um, did a study uh, about 10 years ago that showed that the average location where you see that spike of litter happens at about 29 feet. Um, and at that point, that's when you see it continuously go up. It's about a three-fold increase when it's not within that, that, that distance. Um, but one of the people who's known this all along also is the Walt Disney Company. So the Walt Disney Company, if you've been to Disneyland or Disney World or even any of their international sites, you will know that that distance that they found in the 1950s, there's some skepticism as to who started it, but most believe that Disney himself watched someone with a piece of litter, how many steps they would take before they threw it on the ground, and now that's where the containers are located. Um, one of the things that ties back into some of the things that Morgan is talking about is through the use of apps, this can now also be tracked to see where that distance is between those locations also. And is that having an, an impact on the distance and the further away? Uh, one of the things I will point out from Disney too, and talking to some of their, um, their individuals that are responsible for their waste management talks about that they do twin the bins, but they only twin the bins, as you'll see in the photograph of a, of a trash receptacle and a recycling uh, receptacle, where they know that they're going to have access to those bottles and cans, that in locations that don't sell bottles and cans, they actually don't put those recycled bins because they don't want to kind of create the confusion in that process. So on the next slide, you'll show an example of an, an actual park um, that has the, the bins. And it, at first, 
look, it's like it almost seems like it's a it's an overreach on, on having that many bins. Um, this is a, a tennis center location. That's a uh, the building in the center. Uh, you can rent your equipment. You can also buy snacks, have concessions of different types. They have the bins at the locations next to benches and access into those facilities. And they also have bins at the call out that you'll see in the top right hand corner of bins next to um, the actual seating area. If you, one of the reasons why not only the distance, but the placement in this particular uh, picture is important is that if you turned around and put your back to this building directly across from this facility, um, about a thousand yards is a lake. It's a water detention facility that's also located in this facility. And they were having a great deal of contaminate or of, of litter um, in, the, in the area. And so the placement of the bins strategically assist in keeping the litter out of that waterway. Uh, and it also meets that distance. You really can't miss one of these, these bins. Um, through GIS tracking, you can uh, also see uh, the place and, and how this fits into that watershed area uh, that, um, that Morgan was talking about in her research. But sometimes maybe there are too many bins. So the, the next research that I wanted to share with you uh, is a study that um, was done uh, in a very large urban park. Um, and um, in this particular um, study on the, the, the next slide, um, they wanted to look at the possibility of whether or not they could take the bins that were scattered throughout the park and put them only at entry points into the park facility. And primarily this was due to the fact um, that there were challenges because of the size of the facility in being able to monitor and actually um, remove uh, the litter effectively from those containers so that they didn't overflow and become uh, a, even a bigger, a bigger problem. So um, they tried several different testing out uh, of the process. Uh, they initially just moved the containers um, out of the central part of the park and put them at the, the open area. And unfortunately, what they saw was that the litter increased. Um, and that, that one piece of litter, as the descriptive norms had been shown in that earlier uh, research, uh, attracted more litter and they had a problem. So they, they looked to try to identify what was something else that could, could help. And they put these watchful eyes and they created messaging um, about help us keep our park clean uh, and that, that others may be watching you. So the animals' eyes were attached uh, to various uh, points of, of trees and other locations throughout the park. And the results did show uh, that the litter was basically eliminated. Um, it worked to have the containers on the outer edges without them inside, but it needed that added norm, that added kind of pressure uh, point to be added to, to give a message that we're not going to litter in this park, even though there may be fewer containers than that, that traditional 25 to 30 step areas. Kind of related to this uh, is another study that I wanted to share on the next slide that talks about the correlation between the beauty and the cleanliness uh, of a park site itself um, and how um, the beauty when matched up with infrastructure can actually uh, result in um, a decrease of the, 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 litter, the littering conditions. So uh, perception surveys were done actually talking to individuals who use these parks through intercept interviews. And overwhelmingly, the comments made by the users of those parks talked about that the perceived beauty and cleanliness had a positive connection on why they like to come to these parks and why it was uh, important to them. Uh, so the environmental cleanliness has a direct correlation uh, to, the, um, to the connection uh, of where the containers are placed, the maintenance of those containers, but having those containers had that sense of building uh, a place and ownership in the place that they could help to take care of. So past research has discussed um, how to 
kind of mix these norms of talking about an anti-litter norm along with the environmental cleanliness norm. And kind of the crossing point has to be the container and where the containers are located, which leads me to the next slide and research that talks about ongoing maintenance and the types of containers. So uh, you have that correlation between beauty and cleanliness, but you also have to look at the types and placement of the containers. And I know when I first started, I was like, give me any kind of container, I'll take it. Uh, it doesn't matter what it is. So the barrel, the open top, um, that worked great. It's like, you know, give us something that, that that we can use. But we've also found out through a lot of research that lids matter. Um, so the, the, the slide in the second show, uh, slide in the, the uh, second picture on the slide, there is uh, in Honolulu at Ala Moana Park. Um, and just past those trees is the ocean. And the containers had all been open topped. And there was a great deal of concern about um, the, the amount of trash that was in that park. Uh, and that it was getting to the ocean, and it was very clear that it was the trash cans. But we had to use some of that technology that Morgan talked about of actually tracking the litter from those containers uh, out into the parks and the proximities to say one of the things that can be done is having the right kind of container, which is having one that had a closed top to reduce that, that litter situation in the area. Um, also, uh, that question of, of, you know, will people litter when there's not recycling containers? The picture on the far right side uh, is um, a location. Um, they do have a bottle bill legislation. Um, there was not a bin near that one that would collect recyclables. That bin is already full, but we still had the, the, uh, the cans on the top. So people wanted to do the right thing. They didn't have the infrastructure to do it. So they did the next best thing. In this particular case, it's a little better than the open containers on the far left because it had a lip to try to keep it from blowing to blowing out. But um, fewer cans sometimes can actually be a good thing because um, as Several of the researchers in this area have shown that uh, there can be a contradiction if there are too few containers, if the bins are not within a site pattern, and also if they're overflowing. Uh, that overflowing bins are just going to cause additional problems. So you do have to try to figure out your placement of bins, the attractiveness of the bins, how it fits into the settings. The next slide uh, documents uh, a public service um, uh, focus group analysis, and this was done um, as part of the Don't Mess With Texas campaign to look at what are messages that can be placed in an area that's going to help to create that strong sense of community and how you can associate that both with, um, with safety and with uh, the, the community affairs and being able to make that connection. So awareness and messaging can be key uh, to the programs. It's not necessarily that you're going to put this on your containers in all of your public spaces, um, but it's a good thing to, to, to do is to try to test out in your market, what are the messages that are going to resonate most with your, your residents um, and to be able to try to target those messages that littering is an unacceptable behavior and we're going to try to encourage a, a culture of cleanliness uh, and litter free and at the same time um, have something that, that's positive and attractive in the area. Uh, one of the things that this focus group found is that the younger aged groups were influenced actually by that $500 fee. They thought that that would have a, an impact that the younger generation really does see that financial connection, older generations may not have that same connection uh, to the process. And so finally, in conclusion, um, litter is a challenge. Uh, it's a complex issue, and it's one that uh, requires a lot of, um, of targeted behavior. Uh, research scientists in general, from some of the ones that early uh, created um, a research, uh, Dr. Geller in the 1970s up to Dr. Schultz in the 2000s, um, 
will show on the next slide that that litter originates from the behavior, uh, and 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 usually that's with intent. So it's it's going to be challenging for everybody uh, who's dealing with this this issue. Um, but we have to target the behavior at the location. So as Morgan was saying, looking at a location, trying to do those watershed tracking, trying to be able to uh, follow that process. Um, is very important. What works, and I think you'll hear this in our next case study, what works in one part may not work in another. So it's going to require an integrated strategy. Uh, clean and beautiful does make a difference. Uh, keeping it clean makes a difference. Um, having strategic infrastructure, looking at what those walking paths are, making sure that they're in the areas. Um, thinking about creative alternatives, if that 25 to 30 feet separation doesn't work for you, maybe something like the watchful eyes or, you know, uh, parks partners can help to change that, that messaging uh, to, to, to be involved with that positive messaging. And active community participation, having an ownership of a park uh, by residents makes the biggest difference, not relying completely on um, just the parks crews or the waste crews or, or, or the government employees to clean it up, but how can we have those partnerships so that people are getting out and assisting with the process. So thank you for your time and hopefully uh, maybe some of these research studies can help you in addressing some of the litter issues that you may be facing in your parks and public spaces. Great. Thank you, Cecile. Uh, that was a great overview. Uh, here's your, your contact information if you want to reach out to Cecile. Um, let me introduce one more live poll and then I have a question for you as well, Cecile. Um, so, uh, for everybody, what efforts um, are, are being taken to monitor performance? So again, assuming that you are actually involved directly with, with operating a, a collection program for waste in public, um, have you done formal litter mapping, actually going out and, and using the KB or other methodologies to track where litter is showing up in relation to bins, um, doing large-scale waste audits, tracking um, even things like, like tracking actual waste as opposed to just guesstimating, but tracking by location. Um, so go ahead and uh, put in your responses for that. Cecile, uh, I guess my, my question for you would be, um, I think a lot of us are familiar with the, with that Disney uh, stats um, that's out there and, and it's a rule of thumb, lots of views. I'm curious, for, from my experience, there's definitely context can influence behavior in litter and, and, and how far people are willing to go. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more to that. And, and as an example, um, college, colleges and universities are seeing there's a trend towards eliminating lots of outdoor bins because they found that they can get away with doing that without a corresponding increase in litter. But there's obviously different situation happening there with usage patterns. I wonder if there's any, if, if you could talk a little bit more to where nuance comes into that or not. Well, I think that's why it comes back to all local issues there. I mean, all litter is a local issue and, and local issue means you have to go to where that site is and try to figure out. And the colleges and university campuses, um, you have a more controlled group as well that's using that, that you can do more um, education uh, and public awareness about not only in the public space, but potentially um, in the facilities themselves as well. You can also concentrate on the points of origin of where the materials come from. And I think that ties into Disney's comment about we need to have the containers where they're located close to where the origin of the litter product may come from. Um, I know in a research study that I did um, this last year in a rural location in Tennessee, they actually were trying to pull the containers from their public space because they were having difficulty because of the, the, the amazing uh, outpouring of people wanting to get out and, and, and go from the urban area to the rural areas, um, but they couldn't service those bins. So they put the containers at the, 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 the entry into the, the parking area, took them out of their parking lot. Um, so that that way it was like they were encouraging people that if you're going to go on the trail, this is where you need to bring your material back to. It's like pack it in, pack it out. So trying to think about the site specific, and I wish there was a magic, it works this way everywhere, but it doesn't. And I think that's the difference, why it works at Disney, why it works on those college campuses may or may not work in some of the other areas. 
Yeah, that makes sense. Um, it, 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 there are certain locations, I think, where you're more susceptible to what I think of as kind of the movie theater effect. There, there, there's the social expectations themselves shift from one location to the next. Um, I can see on a college campus, you're more surrounded by your peers. You're more conscious of being seen and that perception, whereas that may not be the same if you're walking down the streets um, in the middle of the city. I guess it's a more controlled environment. It's where like, I am fascinated and scared by the idea of cell phone technology. But I think that, again, I think that's why you may see some differences in who the people are that use one facility versus uses another facility. And so go perfect idea about the peer and the peer uh, relationship too may make a big difference in some places. Yeah, yeah good. Um, let's take a quick look at the results for the poll. Um, looks like uh, most, we, uh, about 33% have done, uh, have done these limited waste audits, another 14% have done more of a formal, larger scale, uh, but otherwise, uh, not not a great adoption of any one of these. Um, looks like about 23% have a system in place to track actual weights. So um, obviously, all these take resources. But I think, you know, and we'll talk a little bit more about this during the panel. But um, data is your friend, and to the extent that you can get that you're able to track and monitor and get actual numbers, um, that definitely can have a concrete um, impact on your ability to to address and and improve your program. So let's go ahead and close this down then. And we're going to shift over to our um, our last presentation. And here I will introduce, um, uh, introduce Todd and Jenny and let them take it from here with the, the Seattle case study. Great, thank you very much, Alec, and uh, welcome everybody. What some fantastic presentations. I'm really excited by what's been shared so far and very excited to uh, show you a little bit about what we've been doing in Seattle. Uh, my name is Todd Burley and I work, as Alec said, with Seattle Parks and Recreation as a sustainability advisor. And uh, waste is one of my big issues this year. So this is a great conversation to be a part of. Uh, Jenny, if you wanna introduce yourself. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Jenny Frankel. I work with Seattle Public Utilities. I manage our public place litter and recycling can program and our adopt a street program. So I'm just swimming in trash all the time. I love it. Glad to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. <clears throat> okay, let me uh, advance here. If I can. Help, Alec. Alec. <laughs> Alec, I'm having trouble advancing. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, so, Jenny, go ahead. <laughs> sure. So, so uh, Seattle Public Utilities, uh, we're one of the two utilities in Seattle. We manage our garbage recycling organics um, collection, um, and that includes residential, commercial, and public place. Um, and, you know, we also provide one point delicious drinking water to 1.4 million people in, in the greater Seattle area. And then we manage our drainage and wastewater. I mean, we do a lot of other things, but those are kind of the, the heavies. <clears throat> At uh, uh, Seattle Parks and Recreation, we are a pretty large system. We have uh, 489 parks and actually 6,441 acres. I, I mixed my numbers up there. And our parks come in a number of forms. We have uh, large natural areas. We have uh, green spaces that are a little more uh, rustic, if you will. We have parks that are more neighborhood parks, plazas downtown. We have 27 community centers, outdoor pools, indoor pools, tennis courts, uh, all sorts of uh, different amenities within our system that all come in when we think about uh, what to, uh, like where to place and what sort of bins to put out there, which we'll talk about today. And as you can see, both Todd and I are from very huge departments in our in the city of Seattle. So <laughs> we we both are our own engines in a lot of ways. Um, so just to give you some context for um, our public place litter and recycling can program in Seattle, that map that you're seeing on the right, that's the placement. I know it's very small. Um, but those green dots represent litter cans and those blue triangles represent recycle. Um, so there's about well, just a little over 1,100 of public litter and recycling cans uh, placed throughout 
Seattle. And um, over the past, I would say over the past six, seven years, we've been working really hard to pair every single litter can up with a recycle can. Doesn't work in every location, um, but we are pretty close. You can see there's about a five can difference. Um, and then the garbage cans are collected four to 14 times a week, just depending on where they're placed and th the recycling can, uh, that should be three to seven. I have a little extra one there. We don't pick up recycling. I mean, we're awesome recyclers in Seattle, but we're not that good. Um, and, uh, and then we also, just for context, we contract with uh, two haulers to um, service the public litter cans, and they are the same haulers that service our residential and our commercial. And so when it comes to public litter can collection, we team that, um, we team kind of that um, realm up with our commercial. So you'll see our, our commercial drivers are picking up our um, public cans. That's right. Yeah, and, uh, and I should just at the beginning state that Seattle Public Utilities, the work that Jenny does, they are absolutely the lead in uh, collecting waste in the public space, and and we we very much rely on their expertise and their resources and their uh, their knowledge. Um, however, because of the complexity of our system and the number of parks that we have, Seattle Parks and Recreation is a self haul organization. So we have our own packer trucks, and we uh, bring them to some parks directly where there are dumpsters and other larger waste bins, and then we have crews that go out and gather up our uh, garbage and our recycling and bring it back to crew quarters that uh, then have it, um, the recycling and the compost picked up by a, a contractor, much like Jenny talked about. And also we bring the waste in our packers directly to the transfer stations and other locations. Uh, just one little note, I don't have the updated information for 21 yet, but in, 2000, in, in 2020, we were able to divert about 45,000 cubic yards of waste. Um, it's an estimate based on some of the limitations of our data, but uh, it goes to show that even though it is a complex system, you can have a pretty large impact on waste diversion uh, within our system by giving it a shot. Great. Um, so as far as where SPU places uh, public litter can and recycling cans, um, it's more mi mixed use business areas. We're looking for where the people are. So similar to what Morgan was putting out in terms of placement, we really think about where are those busy areas? What are they close to? Um, we um, place our cans on our public sidewalks. So we have an agreement with the Seattle Department of Transportation for placement of our cans. Um, we're always um, a huge factor in placing the cans is really where can it be serviced? So we also partner with our contractors to make sure that they can service it safely. Um, and that vehicle access is still maintained. We can inspect easily. Uh, ADA access, pedestrians should still have a five foot right away so, for, to walk by. So sometimes that, those can be limiting um, placement options just because you know, not all of our sidewalks were built um, with that in mind when they were first constructed. Uh, and it, in our parks, you know, similarly, we look for places where they're going to, you know, bins will be located in places where they can have the greatest impact, but we do not have a very formal systemic way of doing so. But in general, we'll have them near play fields, maybe near the dugout or, or the sidelines for the soccer fields, uh, place them along paths or near park entrances, as was mentioned in the last presentation, of course, near our building entrances, places like skate parks and pools, active places, wading pools and uh, spray parks. We also have put them in many places at parking lots. And in some places we've taken them away because they, they get used for many purposes. Um, bathrooms or food plaza parks, uh, places that we are, are actually adding in compost this year as well. So I uh, really try to place them where we think people are going to be going and have that waste. Uh, but we are working this year on a waste management plan that will be questioning and assessing what makes the best um, location for our bins. And uh, you know, we'll probably learn more from this conversation to help inform that. And I also just wanted to add another huge player in the public litter world um, in Seattle is King County Metro. That's our bus, that's our local um, transit agency. Um, they have, they at all their shelters, they have, um, public trash cans. Um, no, no, not a whole lot of recycling, mostly just trash, but it it's, makes a huge difference. 
Okay, so, oh my gosh, bin design evolution. Okay, this is like always searching for the pu perfect public litter can and we are just constant students of our environment. Um, so I'm gonna just run you through uh, the, the top pictures, there's four. Uh, so Seattle Public Utilities, we started out with just, you know, the singular green can and those were everywhere, um, open top, uh, cabled, cabled lid, and then inside is a um, inner liner um, that, you know, the, the haulers would need to pull up out of the bin and then dump it into the truck. Um, so then we moved on to, uh, we added, we, we started, uh, you can kind of see that the color change. So we, over the last few years, have really started to coordinate our color um, with our education to our residents and our commercial users, or um, and so we painted, we've been in this steady process of painting all of our cans, our garbage cans black. Um, and then we've been pairing them with recycle cans. Um, so just to give you, it's been a journey. I think in 2010, we had about two, we had about a one to two ratio for recycle to litter cans. And so over the years, we've been increasing to where we're about one to one. Um, uh, so this, some of the model, I, I, don't, I know I could really geek out about trash cans. I know a lot of us on this webinar could, um, happy to chat later, but some of the issues with these is just like the parts go missing. Um, there's a lot of illegal dumping, um, similar things. So we're kind of like moving in this direction of, okay, how do we make trash can more, you know, like better, how, how do we use trash cans to help us manage our waste um, issues in the public space. So the third picture on the top right, or to the right, is uh, another can design, and you can see that it's got a covering, and so it's all one piece, um, except for the inside liner. But the side door, and it's got a side door opening um, that is not locked. And so um, what we found with these cans is just they didn't hold up very well in a lot of our areas. Uh, Seattle can be really hard on cans. I hear that a lot from our vendors. Um, so it's no fault of the trash can. I, I just think it just didn't work for us in a lot of our neighborhoods. Um, and especially not locking that side door, it really encouraged a lot more illegal dumping. And so then we moved over in that last picture you see on the top right, um, we moved over to these cans that do have a locked side opening. They do have, um, which really helps kind of maintain our, litter, our liner stock. And then you can also see the circular recycle uh, hole, which limits what goes in there. So it really helps us not use this as just a second trash can. Um, it's a signal to our re users that it, it is for recycle. And then I'll shut up. <laughs> so. yeah, we, we will talk more about where we came now to in the next slide, but just a little background on parks in our space. I would say you'll notice there are no arrows going from one to the next because we have not been that uh, that linear in our process. But the picture you see on the left is typical for what we have out in our parks and play fields, kind of neighborhood park areas just out throughout the city. And uh, you'll see that there is a Rubbermaid bin with a dome top on it and a flap. And then we have the, the, the big belly brutes uh, that are the recycle bins that are square. They're like 55 gallons. They're quite large. Uh, they initially had some... Uh, kind of coverings on the openings that had holes in them, but those got knocked out over time and uh, we have not replaced them. So you have uh, a pretty inefficient setup that encourages people to dump whatever in the recycling and maybe some things in the garbage too. Um, you'll see the next image shows some signage on there to try to divert, but then you'll also see that the top is gray and the bottom's blue, some confusing messages. Um, that's typically what we've had out in parks so that our crews can adjust where they go and move them easily to an, uh, a location that they see fits. But then, of course, so can the public. And so there's been some challenges with that. Uh, you'll see uh, the next one, there's uh, the uh, black one there with the dome lid in the opening. We went to that in some of our newer parks as we uh, you know, had the opportunity to replace them you know, attached to the concrete pad. Uh, and those similarly have the, the opening for the side to, to slide out and open up, um, but they are not in all of our parks. And similarly, you'll see the next one um, that we've had some of that style out there as well. And then you get even to the far right picture where you see 
we uh, have some fancy ones that our planners put in. They had them, some of them are custom made and, and they look really nice in our new parks. Uh, this one is at one of our newer parks, Terry, Ted Terry Pettis Park, uh, right along Lake Union. And um, they were really nice, but the, the crews hated them after they went in and uh, they got replaced with the Rubbermaids now. <laughs> so uh, it's, you'll just note that we have uh, you know real need to align the bin uh, style and placement and functionality together with all the players. And, and that's something that uh, helps drive us to the next um, kind of where we're at now. I'll let Jenny take it from here. Uh, it was funny trying to find like normal looking trash cans in my phone because I tend to just snap photos of when things are going wrong. Sorry, <laughs> but these are all going to be pretty familiar to most of you that are managing uh, public litter cans. Um, so just missing lids, damaged containers. Uh, you can see in that top, that's a top second picture. You know, we are definitely using these two bins as two trash cans. Uh, this is this is not uh, the recycling that we would hope to model. Um, uh, then like on the bottom left uh, picture, we've uh, experienced a lot of burnt trash cans. We've experienced a lot of missing liners, which are kind of expensive. Um, and missing lids. So just like really trying to figure out like how do we solve for some of those issues? And um, just to speak really quickly on to what Cecile was mentioning, you know, some of the, these cans do really well and like some styles of cans do really well in some of our neighborhoods. And then they don't, they, they do very poorly in some of our neighborhoods. So it's, I don't think it's a one size fits all for Seattle and the way our neighborhoods um, use, use public litter cans. So, um, oh. Oh, so I'll take one, <laughs> yeah. Um, so there are just some overall some important considerations. We've talked about a lot of these as have others, but you know the the trash can design is really important as Jenny has talked about, and that's to reduce contamination. So getting the right thing in the right place. How can you structure the design in a way that uh, incentivizes or directs people toward that decision? Uh, vandalism, as mentioned, was a as a problem. So how do you ensure that you're able to clean those, remove the graffiti, replace parts if necessary. Uh, weather, you know, in Seattle, as you may know, we get a lot of rain through a lot of the year. So what are your weather considerations and how does that impact what gets in there? No one wants to lift out a garbage bag full of water or snow. Um, what about illegal dumping? You know, how do you, how do you deal with getting all the trash that um, is in there and, and can you limit it uh, by making the opening smaller potentially or something along those lines. And then of course, urban wildlife, whether it be rats or raccoons or crows or gulls or other animals, um, you know, maybe even humans. So how, how can you uh, try to design the trash can to prevent impacts from those different things? But then also the, you know, you need to, they need to be functional, like I mentioned, and they need to, uh, you know, what is, the, what is the cost of those bins and how many are you going to do? How, how replaceable are they? You know, is this, how long are they going to last? What, what's their durability? All those considerations. Um, another thing that Jenny brought up earlier on that we'll get into in a moment is, is just uh, getting some consistent look and feel. So, you know, she talked about how, you know, SPU has now gone to the blue for recycling and the black for garbage, uh, green for compost in our city. And so how can we coordinate to create that consistency? And not just in your, what you manage, but throughout the whole system without the public experiences. You know, they don't, they don't necessarily make the distinction between a street level can and a park can. Um, I mentioned maintenance and then staff safety is another one. So this gets into the lifting of the garbage, of the, of the bags. You know, how can you make it so their backs aren't gonna get broken, so to say? And, um, and also one thing that we've done in our bins, which is an unfortunate reality, is all of our um, recycle bins are clear and our waste bins are black. That's a way to help sort it. But one of the challenges we've had is that uh, the garbage bins, some crews have felt unsafe because they can't see needles in there. And so, you know, what are the, what are the concerns around trash that you don't want in there that can, that can be a, a safety concern for staff and how do you address that. So there are a lot of considerations, as we know, and, um, you know, we are still figuring it out, as was mentioned at the top of the, the top of the webinar. 
Um, so uh, this is SPU's most recent can design. Um, we let 150 of these out into the world yes, uh, at the end of last year. Um, and what we decided to do, so there's the pairing again. Uh, we teamed up with uh, Youth in Focus. It's a local arts organization in Seattle and um, a couple of young folks designed or took these pictures and then we worked with the designer to kind of make them fit this, um, to fit the, the can specs. Um, but what we like about the can is that there's a side opening that's a spring latch. So it's not like a, it's not like a keyed lock. It's something that's pretty universal that staff can use, but it's provides enough, um, you know, friction for the public to open and try to put a big bag in. Uh, we like the vinyl art wrap just because we hope it will deter deter graffiti, but also we've got anti-graffiti um, powder coat over it and the vinyl is also kind of, um, kind of allows for easy, like use sensitive surface and get the graffiti off really quickly. Uh, we like the cover top because as Todd mentioned, it rains a lot in Seattle and uh, that water permeates the trash and makes it really heavy. And then inside this can is a wheelable tote. So, you know, we, our, our haulers can actually wheel it right to the truck, put it on the truck and the truck, uh, the truck gate lifts it back. So that's really helpful from a, you know, safety, a worker safety perspective. Um, the sturdy construction and then just the way that we have, um, you can't, I, I'm sorry that you can't see it on this picture. On the right side of the blue can is, um, is messaging, it's a sticker of, and you'll see it in the next or a couple of slides from now, a sticker that says what can go in here, or kind of our, our guidance, empty and clean. Um, and then again, with the circular insert or the circular opening for, to kind of discourage larger items. Um, yeah, so we're happy with them. It's definitely a, um, a pilot though, because we are still trying to see how these do. Um, I think in a few months, we'll have more information about how these hold up in, in some of our neighborhoods. And we've uh, sprinkled them around different areas of Seattle just to test, you know, how they, how they do in different parts of town. So thanks. And it's quite remarkable, actually. So we had our own internal process and we were talking with folks from SPU, um, but Seattle Parks and Recre Recreation actually came to the same bin, more or less, after looking at all the considerations and trying to figure out what would make sense in our parks. Um, so this bin that you see in the picture here is actually the same bin. It just has a slight difference in the, uh, the opening there. It has a little uh, lid you can, you know, handle you can pull or you can push down on and they actually come with a foot pedal uh, as well uh, for those who may not want to grab a, uh, a, you know, <laughs> a little handle. But uh, we found these to be really, uh, good fitting. I think, you know, they're sharp bins, they look nice, they're durable, all the things that Jenny mentioned. Uh, but we really wanted to ensure that we had rodent-proof cans because we have a lot of concerns with that. Uh, however, I learned after this slide was created and we finalized the presentation that we might actually be going with the same ones that SPU is using at this point uh, with the restricted openings, but no, um, no actual flaps like this one has. So, um, you know, as we talked about that, that importance of consistency, Seattle Parks and Recreation and SPU will be using those same bins at, at this point and coordinating the blue, the black, and then in some places a green bin for compost as well. And uh, we will also see how they go. So less to share because it's the same thing. Yeah, that's a uh, hot off the press. <laughs> um, so signage, this is the other thing. Um, that Jenny just touched upon. It's really important to, to have signage to help people know what goes where. And uh, there is an, uh, some online information and other tools that SPU has created, but uh, Seattle Parks and Rec worked with them to align our uh, messaging and our decals and signage to be aligned with what they send to people's homes and what they have in the public space uh, system that, that Jenny manages. So you'll see a very consistent look and feel to these consistent colors, consistent graphics that are generalized uh, and can you know stand for a lot of things. And one thing that at least in uh, the parks that we are working on is to try to limit what's on the recycle, uh, the recycled decals. 
so that we can target certain kinds of recyclables. In, in Seattle, we actually can recycle quite a bit of uh, material. We, we are blessed to have a really strong recycling and, and a very old recycling. So it's much more uh, challenging to deal with some of those recyclables. It's much better if you can take your you know, plastic uh, to-go food tub and wash it out and rinse it and put it in your uh, recycling at home than it is to do when you're walking out in the park and having a picnic. So, so we are trying to encourage certain kinds of recyclable items to be put into our bins, such as bottles and cans in particular. Um, that may not be the case in other places throughout the city, but uh, if you look on the far left, that's more of the parks messaging right there. Uh, Jenny, do you wanna add anything more to the message? Um, no, actually just one more thing. We do put a QR code, um, Seattle has a find it, fix it app. Um, where we do have a mechanism to collect service tickets for like trash cans going wild. Um, and so we did include that in both the graphics of the new can, and then you can see it on these stickers as well. Yeah. Or I guess the middle stickers. Yeah, so, well, I know there's a lot of questions kind of queued up for us. So we'll just kind of um, breeze through this, but I think it's really exciting. Like just some successes from Seattle is like, we are too big departments, you know, like working together and kind of forming this one Seattle in terms of how we manage our public waste. And it is really exciting to kind of move closer together um, in that way. Um, and I think um, I I think there we're excited about the new cans that are coming and then more will be coming both from SPU and both from and from uh, Seattle Parks. Um, and then nimbleness, like I, th I think the pandemic has been a real challenge on public, a, a lot of things, right? But it's also uh, forced us to figure out how we, how we change our, our service levels or um, our placement and just really having to be nimble about, yeah, we have policies of where we place cans, but we also have to like factor in kind of where those exceptions are. And so I, I think that that's, um, part of that that's 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 been a it's just a constant education and uh, we're up for it and then um Todd you want to talk about add anything okay no, no, that's <laughs> so. the one thing I did just see in the chat asking about the cost of those bins I think they're about 13 1400 dollars all said uh you can get bulk discounts of course um but um yeah there's there are other ones out there I'm sure and this picture that you're seeing here, this is from a trash audit that SPU and Seattle Parks worked together on. Um, so we invited some folks to join us and just like dig through trash. And um, <laughs> it was, I was part of it. It was really fun. Yeah. Uh, and it was, a, it was a huge learning experience for me too, just in terms of what is, a lot, what is recyclable in the public realm. I think that's great, Jenny. I'll just say one quick thing about that. That's where that partnership is so key. Uh, SPU had the relationships with the waste haulers that uh, part of their contract was to help do things like waste audits. We had a we had a desire in Seattle Parks to try to understand what what our waste situation was from a from a data standpoint versus just a hearsay from the crew. So we we took the hearsay from the crew. We took the data from this uh, process that SPU managed, and now we have a good foundation of information to compare to information we'll get once we get the new bins out and do a, a follow-up waste audit. So, uh, you know, working together, you can get more done. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Alec. Great, thank you, Jenny and Todd. Uh, Those, there, there's a lot of information in there and um, it's fantastic. Um, um, and, and some great comments that folks have been sharing in the comments. So thank you. Uh, we will uh, capture uh, some of the items that people are, are um, leaving in the comments, uh, examples of what they've done. We will capture that and, and we'll include that on, a, on, a, on the web page that also has the recording and the, the presentations afterwards. So I encourage if, if any of you have other things that you've done uh, that you want to share examples, et cetera, feel free to drop those in the chat and, and as I said, we'll, we'll curate those and make those available for others. Um, so let's let's go ahead and pivot over and talk uh, to more of a panel uh, with we've got about uh, five or six minutes we could do that I'm gonna um, 
actually, I'm going to leave this up for right now. But if, if uh, Cecile, if you want to turn on your your camera, um, let, let me start with just a couple quick questions for Jenny and Todd. Um, there are a number that came in, but some quick ones. Um, scavengers, um, people taking cans and bottles from bins. How do you guys deal with that? What, what's your approach? Because uh, certainly Washington is a bottle bill state. Um, I assume that's that's an issue. Uh, how do you address that? Um, actually, Washington is not a bottle bill state. Um, so we don't have that same issue, but we do have, I think it's more food that folks are going into the trash cans for. So we, like definitely the open top um, has caused some issues for, for litter around the cans and whatnot. Um, so we've tried in areas where that's really happening quite a bit, we've tried to update the can model to account for that activity. Yeah, and, and I would just add, Alec, that, you know, from my perspective, this might be more personal, but as long as the, you know, trash gets back in the trash and the other recycling stays in the recycling, if someone wants to take our cans, smash them down and take them to the recycle center to get a few bucks, I'm all right with that. As long as it gets in the right place, you know, I think, um, but it, it would be a problem if it, you know, the rest of the stuff ends up on the ground. And so, you know, I like what Jenny was saying as far as uh, making it a little more difficult. <laughs> Yeah, it, and, and I know from, from experience that there's, there's a trade-off. Um, a lot of folks want to lock their bins to keep people from getting in. Um, just as often I've seen that that just invites somebody using a crowbar to rip the hinges off. Um, and so the trade-off, is it worth holding on to, you know, saving those uh, a few bucks worth of cans in exchange for possibly having hundreds of dollars in repair jobs and, and all this issue? Um, Our biggest issue is probably um, the liners going missing. Um, just like the different parts going missing. And so that's my, our main motivation to, it, to move toward a more locked mechanism. I've just too much money spent on liners this past couple of years. Yep, very, very good point. Um, let's call out a couple, some specific items. Um, you know, somebody made reference to dog waste. I know that can be a problem for a lot of folks. Um, and, and not just for Jenny and, and Todd, but for anyone, um, any suggestions on ways to address that, that specific uh, contaminant in, in any stream? Can you repeat the question? Sorry, Alec. <laughs> uh, uh, handling dog waste. Um, is oh. dog waste an issue being tossed yeah. into uh, or recycling bins? How do you address uh, that? Alec, I just say it's a huge issue. When, when I talk to the crews, that's they're like, ah, oh, I'm tired of dealing with the dog, you know. And uh, we definitely make sure that we have bins near our dog parks. And then we kind of know what to expect. I think having smaller bins near the dog parks or more smaller bins are helpful because that's really heavy waste. Um, and then, you know, in some locations, there have been specific cans just for dog waste to kind of hold it separate, but we have not done that systematically. Maybe we will. That's another way to think of it. Um, but I did see some presentation, maybe is even through you, um, but of uh, like a solar power dog waste composter, like on-site thing that you could do. So maybe there'll be some new technology that comes into this too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I feel like it's a huge, great area for us in Seattle right now. It's a big problem. There's like more, there's more dogs than kids in Seattle. So, um, or at least that's what I've read. Um, and I don't know that we have, have cracked to that one yet, <laughs> so. That's fair. Um, cigarettes are another one where, it, you, Todd, you mentioned, you know, actually setting a special bin next to them for dog waste, can that divert and pull aside? Um, I've also heard with cigarettes, obviously that could be an issue with people stamping them out on top of the bins or, or just uh, tossing them into the bins. Um, but Cecile, from your experience, is there a best practice around you know, placing cigarette urns in relation to bins or using something built onto them? Um, most definitely. And I, I think it actually maybe ties into the, the, the dog issue as well, but having a specific bin and also with the dogs having a, you know, a specific station with the messaging and potentially the, the, the bags to pick up your, your poop, the cigarettes or it's a targeted litter issue. Cigarettes are a very targeted litter issue. Uh, you need the right kind of bins. Uh, the, the, the research uh, has consistently shown that uh, smokers are very courteous. They're not going to put the, the, for the most part, the cigarette into the trash can because they're afraid they'll set it on fire. 
throwing it on the road doesn't seem to be an issue because it could start one there too. But for some reason, there is a correlation in the focus groups about, about that. So having a bin, um, a, an ash urn that's specifically for that is important. Uh, a study that I was involved with um, at uh, in California at a university campus which is no smoking, we found it was extremely important to have those bins at the transition point so that you went from, from the smoking area to the non-smoking area, that those bins were there and very visible, or otherwise you had hundreds of, of bins. So very similar stories uh, with other transition points. Have a bin, have one that's not made of plastic that'll catch on fire is typically a very important thing too. Yep, yep. Um, let me toss out another uh, sort of perennial challenge, which is um, aside from litter, illegal dumping. People actually coming and just emptying out their cars with bins or or with where their dumpsters. Um, uh, any any if not silver bullets, any tactics that could be used to address that from anybody's experience. And don't everybody jump out once because I know everybody's <laughs> got the solution to this one. But uh, but but if anybody. <laughs> Let's invite our audience, like, folks in the chat, like, <laughs> yeah. for all solutions. I have not. Uh, <laughs> it, it's one of those ones that it's, the, I think the eyes make a difference again. Um, it, the legal dumping has a tendency to take place in locations that are, that are, you know, a little bit more um, out of sight. Mm -hmm. Uh, in, in, in most cases, it's sort of like if you have, even within your public space, there's a location that's a little bit more hidden. Uh, that's where the dumping typically occurs. So trying to make those more obvious. Um, and again, I think that goes sometimes into the creative messaging um, cameras that just popped up. Uh, there are a couple of companies that are uh, created some new innovative technologies, even around cameras, which have been around for decades. But there's some companies that are that are looking at that and kind of tie into some of the things that that, that Morgan uh, was talking about with technology that they're they're becoming more a uh, facial ID. So it's not just capturing, you know, like a license plate, but it's actually capturing the person. So it makes it easier to try to deal with those issues. Yeah. You know, Alec, I just quickly add, I, I like definitely what Cecile is saying. Um, you know, from a prevention standpoint, I, you know, you can do what you can, but frankly, someone will dump it on the ground if they have to. But one way to, to discourage the people who are maybe thinking it's okay or like, hey, I'll just clean my car out. We, we, you know, we're at the parks where we have dumpsters located, you know, we have those locked up with chains and everything. So there, it's more difficult to do it. And, um, and that has helped in some, to some degree, but, um, but frankly, we still get them, you know, you know, if, if people can't put it in the can, they just set it next to the can. So that's, that's whether it's a, something in your hand or a bag from your house. So it's a challenge. Yeah. Good. Um, we're we're coming up against our time, so let me. Um, I'm gonna pull the slide back up. Um, one one thing that we did not address to, we didn't really get a chance to drive into, um, and and it's frankly just a it's a fundamental problem about doing education in a public space on the go is you don't really get the chance to. You can't send a newsletter to somebody. You can't do a lunch and learn. Um, it, it's hard to actually engage people. I did want to share just some examples of what I've seen from other locations around at least trying to do some type of public education um, in an on the go. And, and these are all instances of what I've seen um, oftentimes when introducing a brand new program, you're, you're, you're introducing recycling bins for the first time and, and at least trying to get some um, messaging out there, raising awareness with it. Um, um, and so some of these are from, uh, oh, from uh, uh, Des Moines, Iowa, um, did the stenciling on the ground when they introduced their bins. Um, uh, Baton Rouge of Breck, uh, um, back Parks of Breck, uh, used these uh, lawn signage when they were introducing new bins. Um, another thing they did in Des Moines was um, they, they had flyers where they went to some of the, the, the food trucks and some of the on-the-to-go uh, vendors in their downtown area and asked if they would put up flyers in their windows uh, helping to raise uh, this awareness about the programs. And, and, and this one in the lower right-hand corner, that's actually advertising that was taken out by the National Mall in Washington, DC um, in the subway system um, at the stops where people came up out onto the National Mall. Um, so it is difficult doing awareness in that setting, but these are just some examples I thought I would share of, of where uh, folks have made an effort to do that. Um, 
we are out of time, unfortunately. I, I um, we, we we always can use more time for for panel discussion. Um, but as I said, we will take uh, the comments that have been coming into the chat, and we'll we'll curate those and present those um, up on the website. And we'll be sending out an email the next day with more information about that. But um, otherwise, I, I want to thank uh, Todd, Cecile, Morgan, Jenny, um, all of you for taking the time to prepare your presentations and uh, to, to join us for this conversation. Um, I really appreciate the effort that you put into it, and it's it's great to see what you guys are doing. And we, we continue to work on how we refine and, and improve our programs and, um, and uh, keep going. I want to point out a couple things coming up. Um, our next program next month is going to focus specifically on, again, outdoor bins. This is going to be, um, rather than talking best practices or, or case studies, we're going to be diving into the nitty gritty of what is it that you want with a bin when you're looking to, to, uh, to purchase bins? What are the specs? What are the features? If you're in a situation where it freezes, how do you make sure you've got um, uh, the, the right type of hardware that's going to stand up to the different environmental situations? Uh, what are the, the questions that you want to ask when you're you're uh, working with sales reps? Um, we're going to have the head of our of Bush Systems uh, Research and Development is going to join us along with several of our um, sales reps who are going to help um, answer questions. And we're going to do another discussion format uh, similar to this. So I encourage folks interested to deep, dive deeper uh, to join us on March 23rd. Um, and want to point out some of the resources we have online. Again, we'll have the, the recording and the presentations will be posted. Uh, an email will go out in the next few days to link you to where you can find all of that. I um, also want to point out that I have a blog series I do that touches on a lot of these practices. And, and there are a couple of recent ones that we've published. Uh, one um, that's diving into some of these specs. What are the different considerations that maybe you didn't think of? Uh, I think, Todd, you made the point earlier that um, there are, um, you know, there's, there's certain types of bins, actually, Jenny, you, you made the reference that um, uh, workers hate dealing with a specific bin because there are just those weird things um, that are hard to anticipate when you're looking at a catalog. So um, I, I've, I've gone into a number of these with this blog. Um, also, I've been with a, an old uh, colleague from Keeping America Beautiful. We've been reviewing some of the, the academic research around signage. What is it um, when you're putting things on signage? using images and pictures versus words. Um, so we explore some of the science behind that and, and make some recommendations on, on how to approach that when you're designing your own signage. And you can find um, all these on the Bush Systems website there. Um, and for anybody who really truly wants to deep dive, you're really into the research studies and you want to um, really get into the, the granular level. I've put together this uh, Google Doc that lists, I've had over 100 studies on here, um, all these academic um, or, or, or case study examples of something having to do with bin design or signage design uh, and, and behavior. Um, and so uh, there should be, I think Rebecca's gonna drop a note into the chat of how you can access this, this sheet. Um, but there's a lot of great information for somebody who really wants to dive into this further. Um, and again, we'll we'll share the link to this afterward. Um, if you are uh, doing a certification programs through SWANO or some of these others, and you're interested in getting credits, um, go ahead and reach out to my colleague Rebecca Rainey, and we can provide you just a cert certification of attendance uh, that you could use. Uh, we we can't we can't say who will accept that and all, but um, but uh, we can provide you the paperwork that you can submit, and, and then they will the certifying body can judge if this program is eligible. And with that, we're all done. Again, I wanna thank Todd, Jenny, Cecile, Morgan for joining us. Uh, I'm gonna, we're gonna turn off our cameras now. We're gonna hand it over to our colleagues. I believe we have Chris and, um, and Brian, I believe are joining us and I'll invite them to turn on the cameras. And um, thank you all for coming. And those of you who wanna stay for this product demonstration, uh, uh, just stick around right now and we'll, we'll hand it over. <laughs>